Welcome everyone, this is Amir Mushtaq from U Council. If you are thinking of starting a court action in small claims court, there are a few things that you must consider before you do so, and we will talk about three things, three important things that you must have in your mind before you commence. We begin with our usual disclaimer that this course is not legal advice, so if you have any specific questions regarding your case, you must contact a lawyer or a paralegal or contact the Law Society of Ontario for a referral. What are the three things that you must keep in mind? Number one, the monetary limit of small claims court. Number two, the location of the court. And number three, what other powers does the small claims court have that you should know before you proceed with your court action? Monetary limit. A lot of people already know this, but the monetary limit of small claims court is $25,000. It used to be $10,000 a few years ago, and then uh, the Ministry of Attorney General increased the limit to $25,000. What you want to keep in mind is that $25,000 is only the value of the claim. It does not include disbursements. Disbursements are the cost of um, running that court action. So for instance, when you file the claim in the court, you have to pay certain fees. So those fees are called disbursements. You may have to serve documents on the other party. You may incur cost on that. You may have to prepare documents or book of documents for trial, and you may have binding charges and photocopying charges and faxes and whatnot. So those are all the costs that are associated with running the court action in court. These are called disbursements. So the disbursements are on top of $25,000. There are certain limitations in terms of how much disbursements you can get. So for instance, uh, uh, for a service of a document, I believe the limit is $60 for that particular service. And there may be some other limits, but the important point that you wanna keep in mind is that uh, $25,000 does not include disbursements you claim disbursements in addition to $25,000. Also, $25,000 does not include costs. If you have retained a lawyer or paralegal to pursue your case, you may, and you're successful, you may be able to get some costs uh, on top of your claim. Uh, I believe it's section uh, 29 of the Course of Justice Act that, um, that prescribes that you can only get cost up to 15% of the value of your claim. So let's say if you get a judgment for $20,000, your cost will be limited to $3,000. But what you also want to understand about cost is that there are circumstances in which you can get more costs. Um, the, the, rules, the, the rules of small claims court, I believe it's rule 19, and also section 29 of the Course of Justice Act, what they indicate is that if the other party has acted unreasonably, and unreasonably could be uh, prolonging the proceeding uh, improperly, uh, not accepting a reasonable offer that you made under the rules of small claims court, uh, or acted in any other improper way, you can bring it to the attention of the court on completion of trial before the costs are awarded, and the court may actually impose additional cost against that party as a penalty. So you may be able to get more costs if you are successful in showing that the other party did not act improperly. And also what you want to keep in mind is that $25,000 does not include interest. So the court is also empowered to award pre-judgment and post-judgment interest. These are two different kinds of interest, but those uh, interests are could be awarded and you may claim those on top of $25,000. So all in all, your claim may be $25,000, but the, the total recovery may be higher than $25,000, depending upon all these costs that you may have incurred in, 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 in the process of pursuing your court action. Now, location of the court, this is an important point. Why? Because if you are commencing a court action in a superior court of Ontario, then you can pretty much go to any court in Ontario and commence your superior court court action. But when it comes to small claims court, you actually do not have that choice. You have to commence 
a small a small claims court action in a specific territorial division. So you, you know relevant municipality, if if that could be understood better. And what is what are the factors that the court will consider in deciding which court office, which small claims court office is uh, has the jurisdiction? There are three things that the court will consider. Number one, where did the events occur? Um, let me explain that by way of an example. Let's say you um, you have an office in Toronto and you needed some renovations and you hired a contracting company whose office is in Vaughan, but they came down to Toronto and, and uh, completed your project or worked on your project and you had some sort of dispute uh, because of that service and you're going to small claims court. So now the events occurred in Toronto and because the events occurred in Toronto, you can go to Toronto Small Claims Court and commence a court action, and you don't have to go to, to a court office near Vaughan or in Vaughan in Small Claims Court where the defendant is. You can actually commence it in Toronto. The other option is where defendant lives or conducts business. So in, in, our, in the same example, you have the option to go to a Small Claims Court in Vaughan, just so you know there isn't a Small Claims Court in Vaughan. Um, I believe New Market has the jurisdiction for Small Claims Matter for Vaughan. But wherever the defendant lives or conducts business, you can go to a Small Claims Court office in that area that has jurisdiction and you can commence your court action there. Or, a nearest court office to where the defendant lives or conducts business. So in our example in Vaughan, um, you can go to New Market, which could be which would be the nearest court office where the um, where the court has jurisdiction. So if you, for instance, in this example, let's say you personally live in Brampton and you believe that it will be easier for you uh, to pursue this court action in Brampton, and that's where you want to commence the small claims court matter, you are not allowed to do that and the defendant may object to it, may bring a motion and, and raise this issue that you are not in the appropriate court and you may be compelled to transfer your matter to the court where, uh, the, where the court has jurisdiction or you may have to restart a new claim in that court. So you want to make sure that you, you commence your court action in the appropriate court office in the beginning so that you don't have to deal with any further delays because of the location issues. Now, finally, you want to understand some of the powers of the court. And this point, I have, in my experience, noticed that a lot of lawyers and, and paralegals uh, are at times unclear that small claims court has equitable powers. It does have equitable powers. A lot of people um, who have not dealt with small claims court frequently believe that the small claims court does not have equitable powers. If you're not clear about what equitable power is, you can watch um, a lecture that I recorded a few weeks ago. Um, it's called Equitable Remedies, and in that I explain what is an equitable remedy and what are those powers that a court may exercise. But in this lecture, what I can explain to you is that small claims court does have the equitable powers. So if you require an injunction in a matter where the value of your claim is $25,000 or less, you can claim for an injunction. You can claim for a specific performance on a contract if the value is $25,000 or less. You can have an action for a recovery of personal property in small claims court. If the value is $25,000 or less, you can claim declarations. Uh, sometimes you have a human rights matter that is added to a, a civil action. It's not just a human rights matter, but added to a civil action and it's part of a small claims court proceeding, then you may seek the court's declaration that uh, that the party, one of the party was indeed discriminated and that's a declara de declaration. It's called a declaratory relief. And so you can seek that through small claims court. So all of these powers are available. So in essence, what you want to understand is that with respect to small claims court powers, they are not much different than the superior court powers, except that the small claims court deals with matters, the value of those claims are $25,000 or less. And so this brings um, us to our last point, which is something that you should consider strategically, is that sometimes 
if, if your matter is for $25,000 or less, you don't have a choice but to go to small claims court. In fact, if you go to superior court uh, for a matter that is less than $25,000 or $25,000, you may get penalized for going to superior court in terms of when the costs are awarded. So, but in situations where your claim is more than $25,000, let's say you are entitled to claim $30,000 or $35,000, it's a matter of strategy whether you would like to pursue this your case in superior court for $35,000 or forego $10,000 and go to small claims court. And some of the things that you may consider is speed. In small claims court, the, uh, the matters proceed much faster than superior court. You can actually have a trial in, in, uh, in uh, you know, eight months, nine months, uh, within a year if you move your matter forward quickly. Second component that you want to consider is cost. Whether you are represented or unrepresented, your cost in small claims matter uh, may be much less because there are less uh, steps involved in a small claims matter. And then finally, the process itself is much simpler. You can easily represent yourself if you have done your homework and present your case and be successful at trial. So these are some of the things to keep in mind uh, before commencing a small claims court action. Hopefully this lecture gives you a good understanding before you actually proceed with a small claims court matter. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.